everyone. Welcome to episode 12 of Haxton Knits. This is a podcast primarily about knitting and crafting, and you also get little bits of tidbits from my life here in Okinawa, Japan, which is where I live and work. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram or Ravelry, you can find me there as Haxton Knits. And probably the best way to get in touch with me is just a comment below. I'm pretty quick about getting back to any questions you have there. Um, this episode, man, it's a little bit of a fast turnaround from my normal episode um, schedule. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there really isn't a schedule. <laughs> my real life work is a pretty unpredictable and um, un, uh, uneven schedule. And so that's the way my podcasts come out. When I got time, I make them. And when I don't, I don't. But this week I have time and motivation. I've been seeing all of the just the content explosion that's been happening on YouTube these last couple of weeks. And every time I find myself quietly sitting and crafting on something, I'm just thinking about what I wanna be sharing with the world. And so here we are, we have a new episode and this episode is actually a little bit knitting light. I um, have been doing all the other things this week. So there's been some weaving and some spinning and I am looking forward to sharing those with you. All right, sock madness. Round one is coming to a close and I definitely wanted to get a video up before round two started because once the rounds start, there's no time for podcasting. It is all about knitting, knitting, knitting as fast as you can. And so I showed you last week, my round one socks are done. I noticed, so I went and looked up the stats. We started out this round with 1,105 participants and there were spots available for 950 to move on for the first round. So far we only have 917 people. So there's time. I think we've got just a day or two before the, the closing of this round happens and then there's usually a little bit of a break before the next round starts so I'm super excited to see what the next pattern is going to be and what I get to knit next. Um, I'm definitely keeping an eye out on some of the other teams here so uh, last year's winner I spotted her over on Team Z so that's Maria which is Stickfia in uh, on Ravelry. If you want to check her out, she was last year's Sock Madness Knitter, so of course she's the one to keep an eye out on this year. And obviously I am also keeping an eye out for all of my fellow teammates from last year. I was on Team X last year, so we're rooting for each other as we go. But I did want to show, um, just talk a little bit about the team names. I mentioned this last week that the Sock Madness teams are divided up A through Z and um, this year they named all of the team names after patterns by Adrian, who was Belly Button Knits. Unfortunately, she passed away in September of 2019. And um, when she did pass, she put all of her Ravelry patterns up for free and asked that people make donations to cancer um, charitable organizations. And so I did want to show, I'm just going to put a slideshow through here and talk about um, her patterns and at least showcase the patterns that are our team names this year.
show you some finished objects this week. I mentioned in the intro that there was not very much knitting happening, but there was some spinning. This is uh, some superwash merino that was originally from the Nest Fiber Club. Um, if you've never done a fiber club, when I was a first starting to spin, I really enjoyed these. Um, basically every month or however much you sign up for, you're gonna receive some pre-dyed fiber in the mail. I really like the Nest Fiber Club just because every single thing I've gotten has been so gorgeously prepared. Um, I do prefer to sign up for clubs where you get a variety of different types of wool or fiber. Um, especially in the beginning, I had a really hard time spinning merino when I first started because it's just kind of a little bit slippier, slippier, slipperier a little bit more difficult to spin than other yarns. And so I was a part of one club that just kept sending me merino, uh, like every other month I was getting merino fibers. And so, um, like I said, I do enjoy a club that sends you some different fibers and different wools in, uh, to, just to give yourself in the experience of spinning with them. Um, what do I wanna say about these? So this, this uh, particular, bump of yarn is the April 2018 club from Nest Fiber Studios. It is Superwash Merino and the colorway is called April Showers. I did spin this as a two-ply with a fractal spin. So fractal spin, um, I'll put a tutorial below on you know, I think I mentioned this before, I'm going to link to other people's tutorials because there's tons of good information out there and I am a uh, not a master spinner in any way, but the quick and dirty is that a fractal spin is a way of managing your color. So basically you will divide your fiber in half. So in theory, you will have two equal sections of color, and then you will divide one of those sections in half again, or however many iterations of dividing you wanna do. And that way you'll spin one of them end to end, and then one of them you'll have the two, two parts that you spin in half, end to end, which will make shorter color repeats on that one. And that way you're not gonna end up with your colors kind of pooling or lining up exactly together. And instead you'll get blending and barber polling and stuff like that. And I find that I really love the way these knit up. Like this is, when you see a fractal spin knit up, you're like, oh yeah, there's some beautiful hand spun yarn going on there. But I knit this with the intention of combining it with some other yarn that I've already spun. So this here, got the packaging to remind me. It's also Nest Fiber Club. This is January 2018. The colorway is Pacific Rim and it's a Falkland yarn. So I spun this one, I don't know when, forever ago. And then I have this one, which is not Nest Fiber Club. So this is an organic Polworth and silk blend. I bought this when I was in Alaska. I'm pretty sure I bought it at the Girdwood Forest Fest, Forest Fair at a vendor there. So I'm sorry, I don't have the vendor's name on there anymore. But I've been thinking about combining these in some way. And I also have one more bump of yarn here that I wanna spin up and maybe use all four of these colors together in some way. I'm not quite sure, or maybe I'll do two and two. Um, not so sure. Give me ideas, guys. What would you do with a, a four color, sort of not really gradient? Uh, this one here, I don't recall. I think I bought this yeah, I don't recall where I bought this one, unfortunately. And I did pull it all apart and start stripping it for gradient spinning. <coughs> Excuse me. Gradient spinning, fractal spinning. But I noticed while I was doing that that this got really pretty severely compact during my move. And I'm not, I'm just not so sure how well it's going to draft out. I may try to um, strip this further into even smaller segments to make the drafting a little bit easier, but I'm a little bit nervous about that. So if you guys um, have ever experienced some compressed, maybe slightly felted yarn and you're not sure what to do with it, fiber, let me know below because I am a little bit nervous about spinning up this last little bump. So we'll see what's to come with this guy. 
Um, I also just finished up a little bit of spinning I had been working on. It is a Pygora and a Lincoln Romney cross. So this is a two ply yarn. One of the plies is Pygora, which if you're not familiar, Pygora is a pygmy goat that's been bred with an Angora goat to make a small fiber animal. And I just, I love these, um, these uh, little goats. I definitely foresee in the, in the distant future, me having a small farm of fiber animals. You know, as a avid knitter and a spinner, all my life I have thought about having fibery animals. In fact, I very briefly owned a chinchilla because I heard that chinchillas had nice fur that you could make yarn out of. I've never again in my life seen a chinchilla yarn though, so I don't know why I thought that this animal would provide me with uh, fluffy, fluffy, uh, yarny stuff, which it did not, and it hated my guts. Um, <laughs> But I think it's kind of natural. I, I sort of fantasized about raising silkworms for a while um, and like rabbits, angora rabbits, all small fibery animals. And I think I just need to admit that what I really want is a sheep. Um, but I have cautiously been able to convince my husband that when we eventually do stop moving every few years, that we will get some goats and sheep. I'm envisioning pygora goats and like, um, baby doll sheep, the south down, like the little fiber sheep. Uh, so I could have a, a whole little flock of teeny tiny fiber animals. That's my dream. Um, but anyway, so this one here, uh, one strand is the Pygora and the other strand is the Lincoln Romney cross. Both of those fibers I purchased while I was in Alaska. I know the Pygora I purchased while I was at the fiber festival at the fairgrounds in Wasilla and the Lincoln Romney cross I bought. I was visiting, where was I visiting? I wasn't in Seward. I don't think I was in Homer. Mm. We were somewhere, we got an Airbnb and we're staying somewhere in Alaska. And as I was driving home, just happened to see a sign that there was a uh, fiber festival going on. And I purchased the um, Lincoln Romney cross and this. So this is a um, Rambouillet fiber and these are Lancaster Farm Tough Sheep Fine Wool from Soldatna, Alaska. And this is yarn from Darby. Chief yarn fiber from Darby, which hopefully you can see, but I purchased this at the same time as I purchased the, the other yarn. So I know where that one is coming from. And I... Um, I'm kind of torn. I actually, so I, I did the two ply with the wool because Pygora is very drapey. So this is a just 100% Pygora two ply. And then obviously this is with the wool. And I thought I would want something with a little bit of body, but oh man, I kind of love, I kind of love this drapey stuff. It does a little bit remind me of Kivu in that it's very, very drapey, very, very soft and has a little bit of a fuzz to it. Um, and I suspect that this is an animal that has guard hairs like the kivu, like the muskox does that has to be removed. And so I kind of sad that I applied them together now because I have a project that I could see myself making with this. So I think I'm just going to have to get some more pygora fiber and spin it up for that project. So that is it for my spinning this week. And that is it for my finished objects. Let's move on to works in progress. My works in progress this week are a little bit different than normal. I'm not really going to show you a lot of my knitting. I have been knitting away on my luminosity sweater and my great tapestry and my million other works in progress, but small progress. So it's not really worth showing this week. But what I did work on was a little bit of a, um, scrap project. So I was watching inside number 23. If you don't watch that uh, YouTube channel, I'll put a link below and you can go check them out. But Katie was talking about how she was trying to use up all of her scraps, her scraps of fabric and trying to make things out of them. And it just kind of got me thinking about it. So I went digging through, I have a box where I sort of hoard leftover yarn that I didn't finish or didn't use for a project, but it's definitely viable and needs to find a new life. And 
I pulled out some yarn and I did a little bit of weaving. And so I'm gonna put in some pictures here. The um, yarn is Cooney Effect Garn and the color is, I think, ET. And you know what, I'm just gonna pull it up so that you will know what I'm talking about. On my Ravelry project page, I've called this project Woven Into Madness because I'm not using a pattern at all. But it's the Cooney Effect Garn in the colorway EQ and ET. Very original namings here. Uh, but basically, I just took all of the leftover yarn. I used the color ET for the warp and then EQ for the wet weft and I spun up a what turned out to be a gorgeous little scarf and I was super duper tempted to just leave it as a scarf but I don't need a scarf I uh, have plenty and so I wanted to kind of challenge myself to try a new project and something that I've been wanting to do for a while is actually use my woven fabric for things other than just wraps so if it's a really soft soft sweet yarn um, I'm usually tempted to just keep the weaving as a large oversized wrap and wrap it around my body. But um, I just, I really wanted to actually make a piece of clothing or a bag or something by cutting and sewing into my woven fabric, which is a totally new endeavor for me. I have no idea how to do it. Like I've said before, I'm not a super advanced sewer, sewist. Um, but let me show you what I got. So I showed you those lovely pictures of this gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, scarfy thing. And now I have it all cut into pieces, which is so sad. But I think what I'm going to do is make this into a shirt. Um, I was kind of like looking through my Ravelry queue. I was thinking, well, wouldn't I like to, um, use this as a, a piece of clothing in some way, but I didn't have enough. And I just was kind of, looking and I noticed that my this is a uh, Andrea Mowry everyone knows this one the weekender sweater which is essentially just a completely square or rectangle piece of fabric and hey what do I have some pretty much square or rectangle pieces of fabric and so I decided that I was going to go ahead and cut this into four pieces so there's four and then sew them together to create the front and back of that square piece of fabric. And then I'm going to knit to fill in those fabrics. So basically I was inspired by a very square sweater. <laughs> and so now I'm making a very square shirt. My plan is, this is some seed stitch. I'm going to knit and attach to the edge of this and it's gonna go all the way up over the shoulder so this will actually end up forming kind of part of a sleeve and then all the way back down the other side and that will um, give me a couple of extra inches and it's it's stretchy so the the biggest concern I had was that my weaving was not stretchy at all compared to knitting and so I wasn't really sure what size of a shirt to use and so by joining these panels down the sides I will have some stretch to help get this uh, project up and over my head and so I'm not really concerned about tacking on my knitting to those side seams it'll be fairly easy you're gonna you have these kind of nice edges don't judge my edges guys okay I am fairly new at weaving and I think these turned out pretty darn good for someone who's fairly new at weaving but I'm going to sew right along um, the edges and these sort of selvage loops actually look like they'll do just fine to pick knitting into. What I'm more concerned about is the top here. So I just took my sewing machine and ran a zigzag, zigzag stitch along the top of this and now I'm not quite sure how to pick my yarn up into it. Do I pick up uh, kind of below this stitch? I don't know. I've never I've never had to join knitting and weaving together and it's kind of interesting because as I'm going looking for information on it I'm not finding a lot out there. I'm sure there's something out there and I'm just missing it so hopefully one of you viewers out there have some good tips or advice or resources for how to um, knit onto woven fabric. So one of my concerns is that the woven fabric has a totally different drape and stretch from knitting and knitting is notorious for having changes in drape and stretch between blocking and unblocked, blocked and unblocked. 
And so all of my pieces I have been um, knitting with the intention of knitting them separate, blocking them, and then sewing them on so that hopefully I get a good joining of those two fabrics. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure how this will turn out. <laughs> it's a work in progress. So hopefully next time you see me, you'll have um, a better idea of how, how this piece of weaving is going to turn into a shirt of some sort. Um, something I've noticed with woven fashion is that a lot of people seem to be reluctant to cut into their fabric. And so I am seeing a lot of very square pieces of clothing and clothing without a lot of shaping. And so I kind of want to try to get past that. I want to um, get to the point where I'm making material that I can cut into and sew and shape. And it's really interesting because I've always said that I'm not very interested in sewing my own uh, clothes or fabric. And I think that's just because I'm kind of bad at it and not that experienced at it. And I always get frustrated when I make something and then it doesn't turn out the way I want to. So this new kind of drive to weave my own material and make my own fabric and make clothes is unusual for me. Um, I'm not sure if how I like how this is going to turn out. I actually would really love to do this again and make like um, a panel skirt, like a black skirt with these panels of this on it. I think that would be really striking and stunning, but I don't have black fabric. I don't have a pattern for making that. And so instead, what did I do? I'm just going to wing it and try to knit a shirt instead. Uh, so stay tuned for that future, future progress, future finished objects, hopefully. Uh, something else I endeavored to do this week, I'm looking at it down here next to me, is I decided to dehair some kivyut. So I've shown this before. This is from the musk ox farm in Girdwood, Alaska. And when I was there visiting all of the musk ox, I purchased a couple of bags of kivyut fiber. So the first uh, bag of that kivyut fiber I spun up and I knit it into what I've called the crow pass cowl. And it's just a little cowl that I designed and you can find up on Ravelry. And I designed it specifically looking for something to do with that kivyut yarn that I had spun up. And of course was greatly inspired by all of the knitting that you see coming out of the um, native Alaskan villages and the Umingmak knitting co-op up in Anchorage. But I had another bag left and now I have a couple more years of spinning experience under me. And so I thought I'd go ahead and start de-hairing this fiber. I'll put in some pictures here of what the fiber looked like before I got at it and um, after. So here is just, just some little bitty fluffy bits of fiber. This is the, the first pass of de-hairing the the kivyut and there I'm sure will be many, many more passes to come. Oh no, kivyut down. Oh, we can't waste any of this. <laughs> so here's some gorgeous fiber, uh, still raw, but now it has been kind of skirted and the worst of the vegetable matter and guard hairs have been pulled out. So hopefully there will be some future spinning of that. Um, man, you have to kind of catch motivation as you have it when it comes to de-hairing any sort of fiber. So I spread this all out on my desk and uh, spent a whole night working on it. And then the next morning looked at the mess on my desk and was just like, ugh. I don't want to keep doing this. <laughs> and so I eventually had to. I had to get just the mess of animal stuff off my desk. It had a great smell and lots of little bits of plants and who knows what else. So um, I did push through and get the bulk of that dehaired and I'm looking forward to spinning that into something. I keep thinking I'll maybe design another cowl to go with this this particular bump of fiber too. Moving on to my normal end of a uh, podcast segment. This is all about life here in Okinawa. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about the coronavirus and all of that. So if you are done watching for the day, I'm glad you joined me. All of the knitting and fiber content is done. So now let's uh, move on to my life here in Okinawa. So I mentioned last week that um, 
things were feeling pretty calm here. We hadn't had any community spread of the coronavirus. There wasn't really a lot of lockdown happening. And that sort of changed over this week. We have had, um, I think we're up to a total of nine or 10 cases on island, which sounds like a small number, but you have to remember that this is a small place. So we are 70 miles by about six miles in total. Um, we are not accessible by the mainland. So you have to take a plane, you have to fly to us. We're a couple hours flight from Tokyo. So any sort of community spread is concerning and everyone is getting ready and preparing for that. So we have been um, given guidance on staying inside, social distancing. The grocery stores are open, of course, but all of the they have all these little stickers on the ground with six feet measured out so that people will maintain their distance and um, yeah, so that's what's going on. Just uh, finally, you know, the wave is upon us here. A lot of my friends and coworkers and people in other parts of the world had been commenting about how nothing was really locked down here yet or anything like that. And I, it was coming and, and it's here. So we are uh, moving on to that phase of our existence just a few weeks behind the rest of the world, it seems like. Um, so since I am not out and about on the town as much, that means I don't have new content as far as life here in Okinawa. So what I did was I went and dug into the archives that is my phone. Uh, I take my phone with me everywhere and take way, way, way too many pictures and photos of things. In fact, I'm frequently having to just um, grab everything and shove it onto my computer because I've run out of room. But uh, I wanted to share with you just one of my past um, explorations around the island. I was coming home one day and just spotted a sign for uh, a historical site, which is, I think, common in a lot of cities and towns. There's various signs up towards historical things, and I just decided to follow it and ended up at the Nakamura House, or the Nakamura Old House, as it's called. So right now I'm just going to throw in some of those slideshow pictures and talk to you about that house. So the Nakamura house is uh, typical for a rich farmer's residence. Um, this, this style of house was built usually between 1185 and 1572, so that's a pretty large gap. Um, I think they said this house was originally built in, it just says the 15th century, so they're not sure about that. The house was originally of thatched roof and it was not until around the seventh generation of the family living there that it was re-roofed using the Okinawa traditional red tiles. This reflects the rising social status of the Nakamura family since rigid regulations at the time restricted commoners homes of sizes and appearance. So basically they have record of when the house got its traditional Okinawa house because that's when one of the family members became um, like a government official in that area. And so now he was no longer a commoner and he could get the fancy house and roof. Uh, the, the residence measures about 1,500 meters, and it's a rectangular shape. Entering the main stone gate, the horizontally set huge stone slab separates the house from the gate. This is called a hinpun, which is believed uh, to prevent evil spirits from entering the residence. From atop the roof, as if glaring at visitors, sits a shisa, which is another type of talisman said to drive away un unwelcome spirits from the residence. The house is also protected from seasonal typhoons by the surrounding fukuki tree. Uh, these strong, sturdy trees are over 250 years old and act as windbreakers during a storm. Many of the houses in the olden days were protected by high walls and fukuki trees. Nowadays, the trees are grown for their bright yellow dye, which is one of the three basic essential colors in traditional bingata, or hand-dyed fa fabric, and then threads are woven, which are taken from the barks of the tree. So yeah, basically um, beautiful little house, old fashioned traditional style. It's been well preserved. You can walk through it. Um, it's kind of interesting because um, the bedrooms are kind of behind the, the basic dining room and altar room. And it was noted that the bedroom directly behind the altar room was also the birthing room. So that's where the women would give birth. I thought that was really interesting. I, I think that's just me personally. Um, out in the high storage area, I spotted a couple of spinning wheels and a, um, a little caricature, caricature of a woman spinning. 
uh, it's just a beautiful day and a nice place to check out so hopefully you enjoy these pictures and my not so great narrating if you're in Okinawa and you want to visit the Nakamura house, I would recommend it. It um, is pretty cheap. I think it was $5 to get in and you can walk around the house. They have um, sort of a self-guided tour where you can snap pictures of the QR codes and get more information. They talk a lot about the, um, the roof tiles especially because that's apparently a dying art here in Okinawa and there was only one man listed that could currently um, do the traditional style red clay roof tiles that you see here. Uh, when you're done, you go to the gift shop and they give you a little sit down service of tea and they serve you um, a little jello made out of Okinawan brown sugar. I asked the woman at the gift shop if the they had some weaving there at the gift shop, which I purchased a little a little bag for myself. And she said it was, in fact, um, woven out of the Fuguki tree. She calls them good luck trees because they stop the winds and uh, protect the house. Well guys, that's all I have for you today. <laughs> I'm glad you joined me today. I was hoping for one taco cat free episode, but apparently it is not to be. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe. That'll help me as far as the, you know, the magic mechanics of the YouTube algorithm. Um, as always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. If you're wondering what I'm wearing this week, this is the Root Shawl, which is one of my patterns. It is knit in wool stock worsted, so a really quick worsted weight shawl for those of you who want to get something off your needles quickly. Um, this week, let's remember to support all of our local um, hand dyers and weavers and crafters and our small businesses, because I know everyone is struggling. So if you can support them financially or if you can share their content or prom help them promote their own content so that more viewers see them, that's a beautiful thing you can do this week. Right, guys, that's all I have for you this week. I'll catch you again next time.